can uh, I too wish all of the mothers here a happy Mother's Day. It's a great blessing to have a, a godly mother. I know that from my own experience. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark, which we have recently begun, and we are looking this morning at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 28. Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan. He has gone out into the wilderness. He's been tested by the devil and triumphed over him. Verse 14, now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In the early church and throughout the Middle Ages, it was a custom to associate the four Gospels with the four faces of the cherubim, in Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel chapter 1. In the prophet's vision, the four angels appeared, one with the face of a man, one with the face of a lion, one the face of a calf, and one the face of an eagle. Traditionally, Matthew had been represented by the lion for Christ the King. Mark by the man for his humanity, Luke by the calf and his sacrifice, and John by the eagle for Christ's heavenly origin. But there were variations uh, on these, and the Gospel of Mark was often identified with the lion. The city of Venice, for example, adopted Mark as its patron saint, and the symbol of the city is the lion with wings. Really, each of these aspects of Christ are found in the four Gospels. The Lord's humanity and deity, His royalty and sacrifice are in Mark as they are in Matthew, Luke, and John. But from the beginning of His Gospel account, Mark presents Christ as king. His first statement is, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In the Psalms, in Psalm 2 specifically, the king is called God's son. When Jesus first appears in Mark's gospel, he was baptized in the Jordan, and the Father called him his son. And the Holy Spirit anointed him 
empowered him as the Messiah, the anointed one, as the king. And when his ministry finally began, he came preaching the message of the kingdom with the authority of a king and in the power of a conqueror, the might of a lion. It happened about a year after the baptism. By this time, John had been arrested by King Herod. The voice crying in the wilderness had been silenced. And people must have wondered about John's prophecy that one was coming after him, one who was far greater than he, whose sandals he was not worthy to untie. Where was he? A year had passed. John was in prison. No one had come. Everything was silent. Then one day they heard a voice. Jesus came to Galilee and was preaching. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It was an astonishing sermon. He wasn't saying God is on His throne and the earth is His footstool. He rules over all. He wasn't saying believe in the Lord and He will reign in your heart. All that was true, but this was something different. Jesus was saying the kingdom of God prophesied by the ancient prophets was near. The time of fulfillment was at hand. It was a glorious message. It was good news. Judea and Galilee were under the heel of foreign powers. They had been for centuries. First the Babylonians, then the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. They were captives in their own land. But through it all, the people had lived with the expectation and hope of the coming of the kingdom that God had prophesied and promised through the prophets. So when Jesus began preaching, He didn't have to explain to the nation what He meant when He spoke of the kingdom of God. It was the kingdom that was promised to David in 2 Samuel 7, whose throne would be established forever. It was the announcement that the Messiah had come. And it was the fulfillment of prophecy. Those who knew the prophets would have recognized Isaiah's prophecy in the voice of Jesus. Isaiah 9 verses 1 and 2 is a prophecy to Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee under the rule of foreigners. Isaiah said, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. <clears throat> Some would have recognized that, that this was that. The voice of Jesus was the light of God. If the excitement of John's ministry had faded at all over the previous year, it was quickly reignited. Prophecy was being fulfilled. The long expected kingdom was at hand. It was near. It was near because the king was near. And His kingdom would be revealed in all its glory if the nation received Him by repenting and acknowledging Him as the King of Israel. They would not, we know, and the offer of the kingdom would be withdrawn or at least postponed. Jesus would later say in Matthew 21, verse 43, it would be given to a nation producing the fruit of it, the Gentiles. But in this we see the mystery of God's providence and grace because that was God's plan of salvation. The rejection of Jesus would result in the cross and the redemption of His people. His people are the elect. They are the chosen from the foundation of the world. They are Jews and Gentiles. They are all kinds of people every, from every nation of the earth. And multitudes of them. An innumerable multitude. Christ is the Savior of the world. And He obtained salvation for each of us. The only way it could be obtained through His sacrifice for sinners at Calvary. So, 
As tragic as it was, Israel's rejection of Christ became the very means of salvation for Israel and the nations and the inclusion of the Gentiles in the very kingdom of God that Jesus came preaching. And according to Romans 11, the Gentile salvation will be the very means of provoking the Jews to jealousy, provoking them to repentance and being re-included in salvation, which Paul tells us will mean great blessing for the entire world. But at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, this offer of the kingdom was valid. If the nation would repent and believe in Him as God's Son and its King, the kingdom would come. And so he went about preaching this glorious message of hope. And many people responded. As Jesus walked along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he called men to follow him. Mark records four of them from Galilee who did. All four were fishermen. The first two are Simon, Simon Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were busy at work casting their nets into the sea when Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And Mark writes, Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus speaks, and men follow immediately. That's the power of his words. Now, this wasn't the first time they met Jesus. It it wasn't as though a stranger came walking on the shore, told them to follow him, and they left everything, job and family, to do that. Again, a year had passed since the Lord was baptized. In chapter 1 of John's Gospel, John the Baptist pointed his disciples to Jesus as the Lamb of God, and they went to him. They spoke to him. No doubt intercourse of that kind Conversations had been going on throughout this year. But here the Lord's ministry officially began and they became His steady companions. And Mark was showing that Jesus is King and spoke with authority. He shows that all through this passage in His preaching and commands. When Jesus spoke... Men and angels obeyed. At the same time, his words were an uh, appeal to them and had an appeal to them. No one was compelled to follow him against their will. His command was attractive. His command gave each of them hope. They were ready to leave everything and follow him. He would make them fishers of men. No longer would they be snatching fish from the sea, but snatching snatching men like brands from the burning. They would gather souls into the kingdom just as they had filled their nets with fish. Fishing was an honorable profession. Anglers on the Sea of Galilee earned a good living. But what could compare to what Jesus offered these men, to be fishers of men, catchers of souls. So they left all to follow Him. Now, why would that seem strange to us, to leave everything, follow Jesus, to leave one's practice, one's business, one's means of earning a living. But could all of the fish in the sea or all of the wealth of the nations compare to following Him? I know the world would say yes. They would think giving up one's fishing business or whatever it might be, one's tax collecting business later on if it's Levi or Matthew, would be foolish to the world but not to these men. No, they didn't think that what they were offered or what they left could compare with what they were offered. And so we read immediately they left their nets and followed him. So did the next pair of brothers, James and John, again fishermen, going on a little farther, 
He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. It tells us a lot about discipleship, about following Christ and doing His will. None of the four were, were scrambling around seeking Jesus. None of them were hurrying along to follow Him. Jesus came to them. He found them. The initiative is always with the Lord. He seeks. He finds. And we follow. That's sovereign grace. He would tell them later, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And those he chose are significant. He didn't go to the rabbinical college and find the best and brightest. These four weren't, weren't dull men. They weren't lazy men. They were very much engaged in their business when he came along. They were either casting their nets or they were in the boat mending their nets. They were diligent men. But as the Sanhedrin recognized later when Peter and John were arrested for boldly preaching, they were uneducated and untrained men. And, and the rabbis who observed them were amazed. That's what the Lord chooses, and this is what He does. That's what Paul told the Corinthians when he wrote to them, Consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world. And He's done that to shame the wise, to shame those like the Sanhedrin that looked down on these men but were compelled to be amazed by who they were and what they were doing. Well, that's what the Lord does. That's the Lord's way. It's what He delights to do, to, to, to choose and call those the world dismisses as foolish and weak and transform them into an army that rescues souls from this age and from the judgment to come. That's what He was promising here. Notice He didn't say, become fishers of men and then you can follow Me. But follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The order of the words is important. He doesn't set conditions on us. He doesn't say, first prove yourself and then come. He doesn't say, prove your worth or, or meet a certain standard. He calls people where they are in the daily routine of life, in the condition they are in, and promises to change them, to make them into something great something that they are not naturally. And what can be better than being a soul winner, a fisher of men? I'm not a fisherman. I can count on my, my left hand how many times I've been fishing. I can count on two fingers how many times I've been fishing. And how many fish I've caught. I've caught one. I think I caught it twice, but and that was a long time ago. So I, I am not a... a a person who's skilled or knowledgeable about fishing. But I know people who are fishermen, and I know that there's more to it than simply dropping a line in the water and waiting for the fish to bite. It, it takes skill. It takes knowledge. You have to know where to fish. You have to know the time to fish. There's uh, something of a science to it, if not an art. And it can be dangerous. I, I mentioned not long ago, I think, of a photograph that I have on my wall that uh, has impressed me when I first saw it some years ago. And it's a, a photograph taken from either the 1940s or 50s of a trawler out in the North Atlantic fishing for cod. It's gray and stormy. The, the ship sits precariously on a massive wave. Water is pouring onto the deck as the fishermen calmly haul in their nets. People die out on the sea. That's all true of those who are fishers of men. It takes knowledge. It takes skill. It is sometimes dangerous. 
There's no greater blessing, but we need to count the cost and be prepared. Still, Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. We, we learn this skill as we follow him. He makes us that. He makes us able. He gives us opportunities and he produces the results. He transforms us. That's the nature of our relationship with him. It is all of grace. And that ultimately is the reason the four left all that they had and followed him immediately. It was their decision. They wanted to follow him. They thought about this. They understood. They acted. But the reason was not because they had such keen insight or because Jesus was a uniquely charismatic figure who could sway people. He is unique, but not according to human calculation. He's unique because he is the God-man. He's the Son of God, as Mark says at the very beginning of this book, and the King. That's the reason his words have power. That's the reason evangelistic fishing is effective. That's the reason the four followed. He is God. Those he calls come. He draws them irresistibly, not against their will. They come willingly. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've come because you've been called, and you've, call, and you've come willingly, gladly, naturally, and here they follow. They follow immediately. That's the power and authority of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the authority of God's Son and the King, which He, he signaled in His preaching of the kingdom, then demonstrated by his calling of his disciples. He has authority over the souls of men. Now he demonstrates his authority over the spirits of darkness. When he enters a synagogue on the Sabbath and expels the demons. It was in Capernaum, the home of Peter, a fishing village located on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Remains of an ancient synagogue are still there today. This is where he settled, the Lord settled during his ministry in Galilee. So on the Sabbath he went to the synagogue and he was asked to preach. Now that was a, a common practice among the Jews to invite a, a visiting teacher to preach from the scriptures. He did. And Mark writes, his teaching amazed all who were there. They said he was teaching as one having authority, not as the scribes. The scribes were the, the Jewish legal authorities, the, uh, the scholars uh, on the law. And we know how they taught. It's found in the Mishnah. Mishnah is a collection of writings from uh, the time of Christ and about uh, 100, 200 years after Christ. And we have collected in these multi-volumes uh, the different discussions, debates, rulings of the rabbis. And so we see there how they would teach, how they would speak. And all through the Mishnah are the statements like, the school of Shammai declares, and then it would give the opinion of that school or of a particular rabbi. And that, that's answered with. But the school of Hillel declares, and then it would give the opinion of that school or that group of rabbis. And so it would go, one opinion against another. Now that's how the scribes taught. They taught according to these traditions. They taught according to these competing opinions. And, and often they taught on the, the minutia of my, mundane subjects, like what one could or could not do on the Sabbath. And went on and on uh, in all kinds of detail. Now, Jesus didn't do that. He taught the scriptures, and his teaching rang with authority, not opinions. Mark didn't record the sermon because he was more interested in Jesus' works than his words. 
But Matthew records that he was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. His teaching was relevant. It was all about God and His plan. And it gave people hope. He gave them God's good news. They'd never heard anything like it. And they were amazed, Mark said. But the power of the Lord's authority was felt by others. By demons who possessed a man who had entered the synagogue And in a burst of emotion, the man cried out saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The the man speaks, but he speaks under the influence of the demon or demons. We could understand this to be a plural of more than one. But demon or demons who so possessed this man that they, that they all spoke as one, they spoke in his voice. As he spoke, they spoke. But what is especially noteworthy about this is the unclean spirit knows who the Lord is. And he explains him precisely. He explains him theologically. He was, or he is, Jesus of Nazareth and the Holy One of God. They recognize that He is the Son of God, as Mark stated at the very beginning of the Gospel, and the Son of God is Jesus the man. The demons understood what the theologians call the hypostatic union, that Christ is God and man in one person, Jesus the Holy One. And yet, those in the synagogue did not know that, did not understand it. What a condemnation that is. They they were amazed at his teaching. They had never heard anything like it. He taught with authority. They were right, but they didn't know why. The unclean spirit did. He is God incarnate. That's what he was saying. Even the demons know the truth. They believe in God, James tells us, and shudder. They shudder. And that's the response here. And with good reason. They knew the plan of God. And and this was the day they dreaded when the Son of God would come into the world and begin His ministry because it meant the beginning of the end for them. So he frantically cries out, What do we have to do with you? Which has been paraphrased, Mind your own business. Uh, well, it, it, if it's both a protest and it's a plea to be left alone. But Christ cannot leave evil alone. He came to destroy the works of the devil and uh, the evil had to be cast out. And the Lord did. Verse 25, Jesus rebuked him saying, Be quiet and come out of him, throwing him into convulsions. The unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. Now there is a lot of this in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus exercising demons, casting them out, which was unusual. There is not a lot of emphasis on demons in the Old Testament or casting them out. Uh, the only thing that uh, resembles it, at least as, as, as I reflect upon it, is David playing the harp to calm Saul when he was tormented by an evil spirit. But even then the spirit would leave and then it would come back. Satan was active He was behind idolatry. Moses writes in Leviticus 17 verse 7 about that. He warns the nation against sacrificing to goat demons. That's what they'd be doing if they're sacrificing to idols. But but it seems in the years before the Lord's birth there was an explosion of demonic activity in the land. There were Jewish exorcists in the years between the Old and New Testament in the intertestamental period. who who tried to overcome these dark powers, but with with little success. In Acts 19, there's an example 
of that, an example of some Jewish exorcists, seven sons of a priest named Sceva who attempted to cast out a demon and the result was disaster for them. So when Jesus came into Galilee where the people were walking in darkness, walking in spiritual darkness and bondage, it was filled with sickness, it was filled with blindness and leprosy and all kinds of ailments and it was filled with the demonic. It was a dark place, as he describes Galilee. Their physicians couldn't heal. Their priests couldn't exercise. And Jesus began preaching the kingdom of God, preaching that it is near, the king is present. He spoke with authority. He had power, such power that the forces of evil obeyed him. And so... The lion is a good symbol for the book of Mark, certainly for the first chapter of Mark. The Lord began his ministry with authority and power and defeating the devil. And again, the people were amazed. What is this, they asked, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. They'd never heard, they'd never seen anything like it. And news about him spread immediately throughout the whole region of Galilee. That was the beginning of the Lord's public ministry. He came into Galilee like a mighty lion, destroying the works of the devil and preaching with authority, preaching the good news of the kingdom. It was a foretaste of the kingdom that he offered. Satan would be overthrown and his dark forces would be driven out. He was offering the nation a kingdom of that. He was offering the nation a kingdom of justice and purity. That's what the millennial kingdom will be. In fact, it will begin with the binding and the imprisonment of Satan. That's what we read in Revelation 20. His influence will be completely removed from the earth. The earth will be clean. And that kingdom is near. Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. In the meantime, we live in a world where Satan is active. Paul calls him the prince of the power of the air and the god of this world. He hits us with his fiery darts. We are in a spiritual battle daily. But Christ is at work to give us power over him so we can stand firm against his schemes. We can resist the devil. The devil cannot rule where Christ reigns. So we're to follow Jesus. And as we do, we become like Him. That's sanctification. That's the work of the Lord in the heart of every one of us. And involved in all of this is what He makes us in regard to others. He makes us fishers of men. He makes us an army of soul winners and soul healers. Spiritual physicians. 300 years before Christ, Alexander the Great said... I'm not afraid of an army of lions led by a sheep. I'm afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. That was almost prophetic. It is us. Within two decades of the resurrection, men were saying of the apostles and the church, these men have turned the world upside down. That's what sheep do when led by the lion. So may may God, by His grace, enable us to follow Him. It's what we are to do. He will change us. He will make us like Himself. He will make us to be fishers of men. The net we throw out into the sea of humanity is God's Word. The message is repent, the kingdom 
is near. Salvation is near, nearer today than yesterday, nearer every day. Enter that kingdom, become citizens of heaven and the world to come by turning in faith from unbelief to the king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ who died for sinners. Come to him. He receives all who do and changes you, changes us to become people like him and a mighty force for him. May God help you to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us and we thank you for this great text of Scripture that tells us of the great power with which Jesus came on the scene and the influence that he had, the power that he had over men and over angels, evil angels, and yet it was a gloriously good power. It transforms and it delivers. And we thank you that by your grace you poured that out on us who have put our faith in him. Our faith in him is the work of your grace. And our perseverance in that faith, our continuance in that faith is your work of grace. And we know you will complete the work that you have begun. You begin it, you continue it, you complete it. We are debtors to mercy alone, and we give you the praise and thanks for the mercy upon us. But may the thought of that move us to be men and women who gladly follow our Savior and live for him. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.